I mean, I, I had no ideas. I had no no clue of what I was going to do. So technically, when I came to PGM, I came in as a guest. I still moved as a guest, but I felt like I was moving like a ghost. Could it be that when some of you called upon God in the midst of despair and said, God, help me? Maybe you were sick and you said, God, help me. God began to pursue you and he sent somebody to get your attention. Welcome to Pacific Garden Mission. I'm standing in the heart of an amazing historic ministry. When I came down here years ago as a student from Moody Bible Institute, my eyes were opened as I saw the plight of the hurting, the homeless, the desperate. It really opened up a whole new world for me. And I saw what this organization, what this ministry did to help them, but not only, not only what they did socially, what they did spiritually. To see men and women that came through these doors homeless, maybe addicted on drugs, drunk, and then a few months later after they come to Christ, see them sober and in a straight mind and see their families gathering around them and see them begin to grow in Christ, I thought there is no better place than this place. So I've loved this place. It's an exciting place. And it's a place where God is doing many miracles in the hearts of men and women. So I want you to watch and see what God is doing through this ministry. And I want to welcome you to Pacific Garden Mission. My name is uh, Ronnie Cox. Um, I've been uh, here at the mission for about a month and a half right now. Uh, this is my second go around being here. Before the hand of me being put the first time in PGM, um, I didn't want to live. Um, that's mainly the story. Um, I was a teacher for 17 years. I taught uh, elementary through kindergarten. Um, I lost my job, my life, my, my money, everything to a DCFS case because the mother of my kids was murdered. So mind you, I'm already dealing with tragedy while it's going on. And in between of that, my mother died. My grandmother died. My aunt died. So I had to deal with, on top of death, and then dealing with my substance abuse and then dealing with my kids and everything. And then when I was uh, detained, we're gonna say detained, and taken out of my job by DCFS, that was the deal breaker for me. I, I really did not want to live anymore. My kids were removed from, uh, technically I was teaching that day. Um, the, the officers came in my classroom and arrested me in my classroom for child endangerment, or not endangerment, uh, physical. I had to put, now I put my hands on my own daughter. Uh, we came to an altercation where, um, as a parent, you just had enough. It's not much, <laughs> we're not, there's no more to talk about. And really, I don't regret doing what I did, but I regret how I handled it, if that makes any sense. Um, in general, that's what part I played in that role. At that point, them removing the kids just tore me apart. I was arrested in my school, with, in front of my peers and my boss. So that was a real pride breaker for me for 17 years of, of, of duty. Losing, what, uh, 39,000 in pension, 67,000 a year? Yeah. Having to start over at 40? Yeah. That's, that's, that's something that you, you know, most people don't really bounce back from. Two years prior to that, I was in a car accident and I was paralyzed from the top up. So, you know, um, it, this, it, wasn't, it wasn't handing me a, a really nice deck. I was in a major car crash. Uh, uh, 40 mile per hour, uh, but all the air flags deployed. Uh, the bags almost broke my neck. Um, I had two vertebrae removed from my neck at that time, and the airbag and the, the, the things that came out of the airbag burned me, the, the glass and all that. So, and then two, I couldn't move my arms. So that was a paralyzing situation where I had to go through during COVID. Uh, so I had to be alone for that surgery. So those two times, I'm like, okay, what are you saying to me here? Because everybody else in my family is gone. So why am I here? You know, that, that was the question I was asking. When you get to sit in a hospital for a while and just sit there and think, um, I, I felt very fortunate, but I felt damned at the same time because of the fact that I just got my life together. 
now we're going back to something else again. So depression kicked in again. So I got to a point where life didn't really mean too much without my kids. That was the most important thing to me. I mean, I was, I was happy being a father. Um, after that point, um, the courts, the timing, the drugs increased because of the fact of I, I just didn't want to be here. I knew I didn't want to be here because they were what I was living for. Um, I came down to a point in my life where, you know, uh, I had to find myself again. I didn't even know I was really sitting walking around depressed. I thought I had everything covered because number 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 one wasn't focusing on him. Number two, I you know, it's like what do I need to do to do this? And my brain was exasperated. So everything that I overcame and then it was by the God highest almighty, really, because it's not me. I finally found that out. It's not about me. Technically I just shut down. And from treatment to treatment and this and that, I think I did two treatments in between. But only when I got here, you know, when it, once it, it changed. I mean, I, I had no ideas. I had no, no clue of what I was going to do. So technically, when I came to PGM, I came in as a guest. I still moved as a guest, but I felt like I was moving like a ghost. Like I, like I was just here, you know. So um, at, after a point, I just said, you know what, I'm going to join the program. Um, number one, I needed to dry out anyway. Uh, and then two, um, I needed uh, stability, just a, you know, a routine of stability, and they offered that to me, and then that's what I took. In between that, I had to come up with my own ideas of how I was going to put my life back together. I had to reach out to God. Um, There's nothing else I could do. I exasperated and exhausted anything, anything in my brain that I could do. So that's the only thing I did, could do is call out to him and say, look, I take this off my chest. Take the weight off. Let, please help me for, to forgive others. That was the hardest part, you know, just dealing with my, not the, it's really not the financial. It's, it's, it's the mind torture that you torture yourself with, which, which, which we do, you know, just, which sends us into slums of how we feel is, is just beating ourselves up, let alone letting somebody else beat us up. So I came into the program, I did the 90 day, um, in between of there, um, started implementing pieces of my life back together and plus using the Lord. Uh, at the same time, uh, which was, you know, I always thought it was about me. And I did this and I put myself in this position. And so I started looking at it from a different dis disposition uh, of that, you know, uh, I do have somebody watching me. And, you know, there is a God. During that course of that point, I did the 90 day. Uh, in between of that, uh, Pastor Phil, uh, James, Carl, a lot of the staff members, they helped me get back in, the, in my master's. Uh, from the bunk beds from PGM. Um, it was pretty tremendous. It was a large feat. They thought I was biting off a little bit more than I could chew. But um, it was a new beginning for me. And I thanked them from the bottom of my heart when, you know, that went down. Um, after receiving my home, uh, going, I'm enrolled in school. Part of it I had to do in the day room uh, because I hadn't, things hadn't settled yet. So um, after that point, I ended up here for another three or four months until my, my apartment went through with my voucher. Things were going fine the first year. When, when I returned, it's because I had major surgery uh, done on my hip. And I had, I guess they call it compartment syndrome. Um, so I had kidney dialysis. I was uh, up in the hospital for four months. I can say Pacific Garden has a lot of outreach you know, that they, you know, that they have the people that come here, the, the resources that, that, you know, I used every single bit of resource that I could use when I was here. If it was something in the hallway, I signed up. <laughs> if it was, if it, was if it dealt with Medicaid or clinic or do anything, I, I signed up for everything. I thought it had so many um, assets that people can use. There's not one place that you can get the social security office, the DNV, birth certificate. I mean, any, anything dealing with your legal assets. Uh, they had legal assets out there. They had a lawyer, um, uh, let alone if you're dealing with cases or anything to that nature, housing. Uh, about five or six outlets came here. I think I signed up for everything. So like I said, if, if it was a table outside, I signed up. But I don't know any other place that offers that much resource, and, and actually the resources actually work, you know, um, and, and, but it took time. 
I can say if you're going through this whole situation and you're living the life right now, patience, perseverance, and persistence. It's the only thing I can say that you need to have. Um, it's not going to come over. It's not going to happen when you want it, you know, because we all have this me thing going <laughs> where I want it now. I want to be, you know, rewarded now. And there's some things that God just sits you down and you have to take a moment. Now, in between of me being here, um, I'm not a very religious person, but spiritual. Um, but I do feel that there's pieces and aspects of the sermons and everything that come out that I get that fulfill me. And even if I'm not paying attention, sometimes I'm not, but in general, it's the fact that I'm around the word and people that are of, of, of sound mind and giving great advice. So it's important to me. I have not picked a religion, but I do believe there is a higher spirit that is guiding us, uh, somebody that has created all of this, and we should give him the most praises high and humble ourselves towards that. Um, that aspect, I do believe. Um, I do believe that Jesus did die for our, our sins. Um, there's other aspects that, you know, that's just for me, everybody. But one thing I can say about PGM, no matter what denomination or creation you are, the doors are open. It's, it's, it's really an open arms, unconditional type of love. You know what I mean? Um, for, for Pastor Phil and Pastor Green and the staff, and uh, I can say uh, at that time when I was here, they did the utmost for me. You know, and, and like I said, there were some sermons that, you know, did catch me when, it, with the, when the guests came in and I'm hearing things. And if it pertains to my life, I use it. You know, sometimes you hear it. You, you can sit down and say, is that that sermon's for me? <laughs> so that's how I kind of, you know, in, digested everything, you know, even coming from just the, being a spiritual type of person, you know. Um, but I do give thanks to all high for you know, God and PGM, you know, they, they, they were a blessing. And even when I walked in the door, I said, thank you again. You know, it's, it's, it's been a, you know, I know what I can do here. I know that it's not hard if, you're, if you have focus on what you want to do. You know, they will not hold your hand to do it, but they will guide you to the water. My calling to come back is to give. That's what, it, that's what, it, that's what I'm on right now. I, I want to give back. I don't take anymore. Um, life is precious. It can be taken from you in a moment. I've, I've had two trilogies of that, and right now, that God is good. Uh, I want to continue on to my PhD. Uh, even this, in, in this situation, it keeps me going. It's something to shoot for. Um, the apartment and everything is not the biggest thing on my mind right now. It's really not. Um, I want tranquility. I want a peace of mind. I want to be able to rest no matter where I lay my head. And that's what I'm working on, uh, uh, inside healing, if possible, right now. My perception of uh, God in the beginning was he's there, but it's me. It's all about me. Um, I was not humble at all. I really didn't even know how to spell the word humble. Um, it was never, anything was never good enough. I had to have more. And I had to figure out how I, which there's no I in team, <laughs> It was going to do this. So um, my, my, my notion now and how I feel now is that, you know, without everything, without him, I would never be here right now. Uh, going through the, the trauma that I did, I, wanting death, then getting two inches close to death twice, <laughs> it gives you a new perspective of how light precious life is. So right now when I woke up, and even from the drugs and, and alcohol, I just want to live. Living life is, is important to me. You know, it, it, it stands for something and, it, and we take it for granted, so. And I learned that life is a present and, it, and we live in present day and it's not, it's a present that you wake up. So that's just how I feel though. Pacific Garden Mission is a place where you can get, gain hope and you didn't have hope. Um, if you really want it and, and you really want your life to change, um, they are there to help you. Pacific Garden Mission is here if you or someone you know needs help. You will find the resources you need at PGM, whether it is with an addiction, a spiritual struggle, or homelessness. Please call or email if you need help or come through our doors in Chicago. It is all completely free of charge. Have you ever wondered what it is like inside PGM and how things operate? You are welcome to visit us for our Saturday destination experience. 
Pacific Garden Mission is in the heart of downtown Chicago. Every Saturday, you can join us for a live recording of Unshackled, the award-winning radio drama. You can tour our building, eat dinner in our cafeteria, and then participate in a gospel service shared by Pastor Phil in our auditorium. Go to our website for more information or to sign up. Or feel free to call us at 312-492-9410. Make unforgettable memories and be a part of this powerful ministry impacting lives daily. We look forward to meeting you. Um, hi, uh, my name is Mitch. I work in the restaurant industry. Um, I ended up at PGM because my restaurant closed and they gave me no notice, so that happened. And then when I paid my rent to my landlord, my landlord took my money and then evicted me. Uh, so within a very short amount of time, I was homeless. Uh, I slept on the train for a couple nights. I slept in the park for a couple nights. Uh, I tried staying at the police station uh, for one of the nights and there was a migrant camp there and they said because I wasn't a migrant I couldn't stay. Um, even with my last amount of money, I went with my food card and bought groceries for all the migrants because there was no food for anybody. So I bought $150 worth of groceries even though I was homeless and gave it to the, to the people at the police station and then they still kicked me out. Um, I, I'm just here trying to recover. I think the PGM is a great place for somebody who needs help, and I needed help. And you know, the food is, you know, good. Uh, you get a shower. You you can you can you know start your life again. So uh, I I thank God for for PGM. I'm working in a restaurant right now, um, and I'm trying to get an apartment through PGM. And uh, you know. All the services that they have here are really helping me a lot, so I appreciate everything that the mission has done for me. At Pacific Garden Mission, we have seen a significant increase in the number of people coming to us for help over the past year, and we always need extra help. If you want to volunteer at PGM, our doors are open to you. From making beds to serving meals and cleaning, there is always something to do here. Go to our website to sign up and find out more information. You will form lifelong memories here and will be helping to make a difference in people's lives. Everything we do at PGM is because of the kind-hearted gifts of our supporters. We do not accept any government funding. It can happen only because of you, from the meals, clothing and counseling, to the Bible and addictions recovery programs. If you feel led to support us, Visit our website, pgm.org, to make a one-time or reoccurring gift and become a part of our ministry. When you do, we will send you a monthly newsletter with a new story of a life changed at PGM through Jesus Christ that you helped make happen. You will be encouraged as you read how God is changing lives at PGM. We appreciate your support. Sometimes you ask or may wonder what brings people to homelessness? What brings them through the doors of a place like Pacific Garden Mission? Well, you've heard two stories of two individuals that have spent time here as overnight guests, and uh, we believe what God is hopefully going to do in their hearts. And I want you to listen to a message, and this message really spans a, a panoramic view of really the whole Word of God. We go from the garden to Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and it really tells a story of redemption. So uh, stay tuned, listen, and see what God has to say to you through this message. There was a man by the name of Meshibbeth, what a name that that is. And probably for years he was living in fear. You see, he was the grandson of King Saul, the son of Jonathan, who was the prince of the land. You see, in those days when a dynasty would end, the new dynasty would eliminate all potential heirs so there'd be no threat to the throne. Unlike today, when somebody loses an election, they go off and write books and make lots of money. That's not how it was back then. 
So typically, if a new dynasty starts, the whole dynasty, knowing that they're going to be killed, many of them flee and go into hiding. That's what happened to Meshibbeth. Here's a man that was living in the desert, a place called Lodabar, meaning a place of no pasture. Here was a man who was a handicap. He was crippled. He was lame at his feet. As a five-year-old boy, his, his nurse dropped him. So there he was with all of his limitations and his fears, and now his grandfather Saul was reigning one day, and the family was esteemed in the land. They had possessions and land and power. And for a period of, of time, his uncle was reigning as he was competing with David for the throne. And now David is king. Ishbosheth, his uncle, is now dead. Mishboth says, I'm the run, and now he's living in this place, and I'm sure he was in fear every day for the knock that would inevitably come to his door as he would be summoned to the throne where he would soon be slain. One day there he is in his house, and all of a sudden he hears that knock that he feared for so long. Maybe his servants, because of his limitation, he probably didn't go to the door, but his Servants go to the door, and the door's open, and there the servants of King David are. And they say, the king wants to see him now. Uh, imagine the thoughts that went through his head. Now remember, we, we've been following the story of David. Saul was cruel to David. It was David that married Saul's daughter, and Saul tried to kill him on numerous occasions. Threw a javelin at him. David goes home to his wife and has to flee because Saul sends messengers to kill David. David, for many years and possibly a decade, is on the run, living in a cave, living homeless. He's exiled into the land of the Philistines where he's placed there by Saul, all because of what Saul has done. And I'm sure Mishbosheth, knowing those things, knowing what's going to transpire, when he hears now David reigns in the land, and he wants to see you. Imagine the fear that flooded that man's heart. Well, maybe this is going to be it. This is what I have feared for many years. Is this the end? But what is it that caused David to send for this man? Again, look, if you would, to chapter 9 and verse 1 as we look at the story here. And David said, and again, David now is established as king. And his mind is probably going back over events that had transpired, and he remembered his best friend was a man by the name of Jonathan, the son of Saul. He's a man at one point, and, and just real quickly, if you would, uh, keep your finger here, but turn to 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 14, then we will turn back here. But 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 14. This is the relationship that David had with Jonathan. And thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. Know not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. This is Jonathan talking to David when David was not yet king. He knew it was inevitable. One day you're going to reign, and I don't want you to kill me, because as I said, that's what they would do. Any potential threat would have been eliminated. And so Jonathan tells David, don't cut me off, and don't cut off my children. Verse 16, so Jonathan made a what? Promise, a covenant with the house of David. Now the word covenant is important. What it means, it's in the, uh, the dictionary definition. Usually a formal, solemn, and binding agreement. A written agreement or promise, usually under the seal between two or more parties, especially for the performance of some action. A covenant was binding. And Jonathan makes a covenant with David. David, I know that you're going to be king one day. Yes, I'm the son of the king, but I know what's going to happen. You're going to reign. And typically what happens is 
the current king eliminates all the potential heirs to the throne of the previous dynasty, and I'm asking you to make a covenant. Don't do that to me. And please, my family, d d don't do that to my children. Let us make a promise one to another. Again, look at verse 16. So Jonathan made a covenant or a promise with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again because he loved him, for he loved him as his own soul. So he makes an agreement. He makes a promise to David that please don't do this, and David goes ahead and agrees. Now look back, if you would, to 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. David now established as king. The throne is underneath him, and now he's thinking back. His mind probably goes to Jonathan, and he remembers the covenant or the promise that he had made. Jonathan also has, had been slain at this point, not by David's hand. Look again in verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him the kindness for whose sake? Again, understand that. It's not for that person's sake, it's for whose sake? We, we, we made a covenant, we, we made an agreement. And now for Jonathan's sake, he's asking, is there anybody left? And what I like about this verse here, it's not qualified. Is there anybody that's worthy? Is there anybody that's done good to me? Is there anybody that, that has been a kind individual? It's not qualified by anything. He simply says, is there yet any of the house of Saul? It does not matter who they are, what they've done, the condition that they are, they are in, because the issue is there's a covenant between Jonathan and David, and I will keep my promise. And that word kindness really is a Hebrew word for mercy or grace. When I was looking at the word this week, it really was exciting. It's a Hebrew word, the word kindness. It's used three times in this chapter. It's a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word is a hesed. It's related to the biblical of covenants. It also has the idea of grace uh, that is extended by God when it is not deserved. God's hesed or God's kindness is his persistent, unconditional tenderness, kindness, and mercy, a relationship in which God seeks after man with love and mercy. It's unconditional. It doesn't matter who they are. It doesn't matter what they've done. I have a covenant with Jonathan. And when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son was sent by the Father to redeem man. And some theologian calls it the covenant of redemption. Amen? The Father sent the Son to redeem fallen humanity. I'll just quote some scriptures. John 12, 49, I'll just quote it to you. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. He said, I, the Father sent me. He gave me a commandment. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Covenant of redemption between the Father and the Son. That the Son is going to come to this earth and he's going to redeem whosoever, unconditionally. It doesn't matter if they are deemed to be worthy or moral or good. It doesn't matter if they, you and I in that sense are irrelevant. The issue is there's a covenant between the Father and Son of redemption of fallen humanity and the Son comes. Look back again, if you would, to chapter 1. Uh, cha I'm sorry, chapter 9, verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any of the house that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? for Jonathan's sake. And what also what I like about this is it's, it's David here who took the initiative. It's not, it wasn't the individual that was the recipient. David took the initiative. And do you know who takes the initiative 
and our salvation, it's Almighty God. You know, I was thinking of the scripture in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9 after man fell. And the Bible says, And the Lord God called to Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? You see, it's not as if God didn't know where Adam was. Hey, where are you? Can't No, it wasn't about his uh, position. It was about his condition. Amen. Adam, where are you? It's Adam that hid himself, and him and Eve ran, and they hid themselves. It's as if mankind was on the run from God, and God was in pursuit. That's why when you see these bumper stickers I disagree with, when somebody says, well, I found Jesus. Look, Jesus wasn't lost. We were. Amen? And it's God that took the initiative because the covenant of redemption. And God took the initiative to save us and to find us right where we are at. And that's what happens here. David takes the initiative. Is there any? Not any that's qualified. Not any that's moral. Uh, find me a good guy. No, it doesn't matter. Is there any? And that's why the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. What? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That what? Whosoever, not only whosoever that are religious, whosoever that has not committed adultery, whosoever that has never lied, whosoever that is moral, whosoever that has never used drugs, whosoever, no, he doesn't say any qualification. Simply the covenant says what? Whosoever. Is there any of the house of Saul? I don't care who they are, where they're at, why? Based on my covenant with Jonathan. I have a binding promise not to cut off any of his seed. Again, look at this here. It says in verse 2, he goes on and he says, And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called unto, uh, him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And again, there's that word again, hesed in the Hebrew. Think about that, grace. What is grace? Grace is unmerited and undeserved favor. David says, I want to show kindness to somebody that is absolutely undeserving because I have a covenant with Jonathan. And based on my promise and my covenant, I want to bless somebody else. Now look, at is there any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said to the king, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is what? Lay him on his feet. And I believe he kind of threw that in there. It was probably dismissive, like, yeah, there's a guy. I mean, here you are, David. Some of his children, Solomon and all of them, weren't born yet. But here's the glorious king with the princes running around the court and everything that came with, with David's ascent to glory. And there it was. And, and I mean, yeah, yeah, there's some guy, but this guy, if you want me to ask, he, David, he's, he's a cripple. He's handicapped. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because you don't have to throw that in there. I mean, is there anybody? You could say, yeah, there's a guy, uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, son of Jonathan, he lives. He, he's a son, of, yeah, he is a son, but he's, he's lame on his feet. What, 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 ha what happened to this kid? Real quick, look if you into 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4. I want you to see this, because this is going to come to play a little bit later. 2 Samuel, just a couple chapters in front of this. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame at his feet. He was five years old when tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. So at that point, Jonathan, his father, and Saul, his grandfather, were slain. So when the nurse hears this, what does the nurse do? Flees. She knew to flee because the king and his son were dead. Possibly there's going to be a new dynasty, and this guy here would be a potential heir. You better move quickly, because you're going to die. His nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame, and his name was Meshib o -sheth. That's what happened as a five-year-old boy, by no doing of his own, 
Somebody else was holding him in her arms, and he fell. And the fall was so severe, his legs were rendered inoperable. Couldn't move. And that's how he spent the rest of his days. And now when David says, I want to show grace to somebody, I have a covenant, I have a promise with Jonathan, and I want to show unrequired grace, undeserving grace. Yeah, he got a son, but David, he's a handicap. Look, if you would, to verse 4. And the king said to him, where is he? Again, at that time, that's a bold, where is he? Again, as, as God asked Adam, where art thou? David does the pursuing and says, where is he? Again, as a side note, as you're sitting here tonight, could it be that the God of heaven has been pursuing you and he has brought you here tonight for a specific reason? I, I can't tell you how many people I've heard from throughout the years. They looked at their situation and they said, man, I never wanted to be at a place like Pacific Garden Mission. You know, praise God for the mission. Praise God for all that it does. But it is a rescue mission. Okay? And there's many... God, why am I here? Could it be maybe the events that have transpired in your life, some of them uncontrolled or beyond anything you did, has led you here because God in His grace, one time maybe you were in trouble and you cried out to God and you said, Oh, God, show me. Oh, God, open up my eyes. And God said, okay, where is he? Where is she? I'm going to bring them under the sound of my word, and I'm trying to get their attention because God is pursuing you. You don't think it's any mistake that the bullet that was meant for you missed, that that accident that should have killed you didn't, that the diagnosis that should have been at the end of you wasn't? You don't think it's a mistake or it's just luck? It's not happenstance. There's no luck with a holy God. God is pursuing you. And God brought you here for a specific purpose. And God asked, or David asked the question, where is he? I want to know because I want something for him. Look on a little further over here. So he asked the question in verse 4. And Ziba said unto the king, behold... He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. And as I said, the word lo is no, and the word Debar is pasture land. So this guy was living in a desert. Again, imagine Meshibbethes. The thoughts, again, as a five-year-old boy, he probably doesn't have many memories of his grandfather or even his father, but he knew that he was in the line possibly to be king one day. His family had vast resources as a child of the king. And now here he is, unable to walk for many years, relegated to a desert, living in somebody else's home, in the fear that one day he would be found and he'd be brought to David where he would be executed. And now David knows exactly where he is at. Verse 5, look at this here. He says, And the king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Uh, amazing. Imagine, David sent. He didn't go himself. David sent. Sent somebody else there in his stead. Sent somebody else there in his place. David sent. Could it be that when some of you called upon God in the midst of despair and said, God, help me. Maybe you were sick and you said, God, help me. God began to pursue you and he sent somebody to get your attention. A friend, a relative, a, a pastor, a preacher brought you to Pacific Garden Mission where the word of God is proclaimed because God is seeking your attention and he wants to bestow grace upon you. So many people, and again, Think of Karen's story that we just heard. What if Karen said, no, nah, I, don't, I don't want this Jesus stuff, and would have just sat there? Would you be where you're at today? So, so many people I talked to during the week, uh, you know, and 
I, I think when Jason came out of here after his incarceration during COVID and was locked down on our dormitories, but decided, oh, you know, I'm going to surrender to Jesus and, and I'm going to give it to God. And now all of a sudden, I think next week you're moving into a new apartment on Michigan Avenue. Hallelujah. No, now that's public. But what if you would have said no? Person after person. When I look at Samson Green, our chaplain, I had the privilege of remembering when he came. Big old guy, Samson. I remember when he came. He surrendered to Jesus. Here he is a gang member. Both of his hands were broken. I remember I was doing intakes. I was placing people on the program. And they said, man, this dude just got saved. And, and the security guy came to me. And he said, man, he said, Bazerville, man, give me big man. I said, man, big man don't need to be on security because big man's going to be out of here. Big man needs to go read his Bible, which he did. And 30 years later, he's still reading his Bible. Amen. I, I, I look at him and I see a man with a wife and with his own home in the suburbs and with his car and with his family. What would it have been if when God sent those people to him, he would have said, nah, I, I got this. What would it have been for some of you? Or what will happen? God has a plan, I believe, for each and every individual. And God has sent people your way like he sent people his way. And God wants to know where you are at. He knows where you are at. And he's sending somebody, but it's up to you. Meshibbeth, they could have fought, could have slammed the door. I would not have recommended that. He could have not responded. But look at this over here. He, he does. Look, look at this over here. It says in verse, uh, verse 6, Now when Meshibotheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did a reverence. And David said, Meshibotheth. And he answered and said, Behold thy servant. I read that verse, but I see it filled with so much tension. I mean, can you imagine? Meshibotheth now is in Jerusalem. He's involved in the kingdom that his grandfather was king one day and his father was prince. And probably others had to help him. And I don't know if he had crutches or whatever it is, but David wants to see you come up. And David stands up and he uses his name as Shibbetheth. Oh, wow. Is this going to be the end for me? What's going to happen? And yes, your, your servant is here. He had no idea what his future would hold, and neither do some of you. You have no idea what your future would hold, and God wants what God wants to do for you. God wants so much more than what you've been involved in. He didn't know at this point. All he knows that he had a call, a knock on the door, he responded. He went to the king. He's face to face with David. I mean, what can I do? I'm crippled. I'm handicapped. I am a grandson of the former king. What in the world can I do? I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to give. And that's how some of us feel tonight. What can I do? I have no marketable skill. I have no great degrees. I have no this or no that. But you don't know who my God is. And you don't know what my God has in store for you. Look what happens right here. Look at this. Behold thy servant. Look, if you would, in, in verse 7 over here. He says, in verse 7, And David said unto him, Fear not. Again, why do you think David told him that? He was afraid. Fear not. You're summoned to the king. Again, remember, David is the man that his grandfather chased for years. David is the man that his grandfather made David in exile in the land of the Philistines, a fugitive. David is the man that Saul tried to kill on numerous occasions. And now David as king tells his grandson, get over here, I want to see you. Oh, wow. David says, fear not. Fear not. Why? Look at this here. For I will surely show thee what? I'm going to give you grace. Do you know the kindness of our God 
It doesn't matter what we have been involved in or who we are or where we've been because there's a covenant of redemption where the Father sent the Son to redeem lost sinners irrespective of who they are. And David tells him over here, I will surely show thee kindness for what? For Jonathan, thy father's sake. The kindness that you and I get for Jesus' sake. Amen? Amen. The grace that you and I get. And that's why the Bible calls him the second Adam. The first Adam fell. And I kind of find it ironic because you look at uh, Meshibotheth and how did he get lame? What did he do? He fell. He was affected by the actions of somebody else. He didn't himself fall. His nurse did what? Dropped him. And you and I fell, but we personally weren't in the garden. Who was in the garden? Adam. Somebody else made a decision. And now we have to go ahead and deal with the consequence of this decision. And now we are fallen, and it affects us to this date. But the God of eternity has made a covenant. He is seeking where we are at. And he comes to our position, and he sends people to knock on our door. He sends people to get our attention and tell us, wait a second, I want to show you grace. Oh, hallelujah. So much is in there. Look again at verse 7. For Jonathan, thy father's sake, I and will restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table how often? Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. As I said, when he was first summoned and answered the door, he had no idea. And now he's getting all of his what restored? Now, now remember, his grandfather was who? So when you say you're getting his land restored, the king, it's not like you're getting a shack in the back, okay? All the king's land, you're giving to the handicapped guy? And then not only are you giving me all the king's land, you're going to make me eat where? At the table? As one of the king's sons? Imagine, again, down the line, they're not born yet. Imagine beautiful Absalom coming to sit at this table. Imagine why Solomon the scholar sitting at this table. All the sons of David, and in the background you hear, who's that? Meshibotheth. Here he comes. But you know when the tablecloth covers him, he looks just like everybody else, and you can't see his imperfections. And you know, my friend, when the blood of Jesus covers us, hallelujah, and, and one day we are going to eat supper at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and yes, we're going to see Solomon. Yes, we're going to see Moses and Elijah and Elisha. Yes, we're going to see Peter, and we're going to see Paul. And how can I feel from the south side with all my infirmities and problems? You mean me at the table of all these people? But when I sit at the table, the blood of Jesus Christ covers me, and I am a son just like anybody else. Hallelujah. Man, that is good news. Amen? Look at this here. And it says in verse 8, And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? What? Who am I that you should bestow this? But that's why it's grace. You, you know, I was thinking, I'll just read a, a few scriptures, then we'll close. And Daniel chapter 7 and verse 27, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So the kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. This world that we were given dominion of, that was taken over by Satan, and now we will be once again restored back to the land that was initially ours because of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, that makes me shout. Amen. Amen. Who am I? I? I think of Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. I saw thrones and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for a witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads and, uh, or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. 
And the Bible says in Revelation 19, 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and the wife hath made herself ready. The marriage of supper of the lamb. Wait a second, now that I'm redeemed, who am I? Who am I? Are you kidding me? Here I am in low debar in this pasture land, a land of nobody and nothing with my infirmities and my handicaps. And there's a covenant of the redemption that the Father met with the Son. He, they promised. And now all of a sudden, where is He? Where is you? And the question is asked. And then the people are sent out to you and you're brought into a position to hear what God has for you. And you have no idea what the... Do you think for a moment when Meshibetheth got that knock on the door that all Saul's lands were going to be restored to him and he was going to eat at the table continually? In his wildest dreams, he never would have thought that. But he responded, Do you know who my God is and what he has for you? And what you need to do is respond. I'll close with this verse here, Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, we don't deserve it. For his great love wherewith he loved us, like Jonathan loved David, they made a covenant. The great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved, and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Listen to this, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ. In the ages to come. Think about that verse. In David's kingdom, how do you know David was kind? How do you know he was gracious? Look at Meshibetheth. How do you know David was merciful? Look at Meshibetheth. Man, he eats every, why is this guy up there? Why is this grandson of Saul, who's handicapped and can't even walk, sitting with sons of the king? Because David's merciful. Why am I at the marriage supper of the land? Why am I reigning and ruling with Jesus Christ? Why am I sitting at a table with Moses and Peter and, and the apostles? Why am I sitting at a table with the Lord? So God can show in the ages to come. You see where Phil is? Yeah, because I'm merciful. Oh, hallelujah, my friend. And if you're born again, we are a trophy of the grace of God forever and ever and ever. And this is what he says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let me, let me close with this quotation by a pastor. When a person works an eight hour day and receives a fair day's pay for his time, that is a wage. When a person competes with an opponent and receives a trophy for his performance, that's a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for his long service or high achievements, that's an award. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize, and deserves no award, and yet receives such a gift anyway, that's a good picture of God's unmerited favor. That is what we mean when we talk about the grace of God. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. All I did is respond to it. My friend, where are you? God has a message and a plan for you tonight. Well, the redemption story is, that is the story. When you think of what God did in becoming a man and willingly dying for our sins, and again, as we close, and, and I want to say this, sometimes when you hear preaching or maybe you're watching television and we get used to certain phrases and terminology, uh, are you saved, are you born again? Uh, and, and we're not sure what that really means. W what the issue really is, is are your sins forgiven? And what saved means is I've come to a point in my life where I've accepted Christ. I believe I am forgiven and God uh, has saved me from the wrath to come. I am saved. Uh, born again is John chapter 3 when Jesus said, ye must be born again. It's not a, it's not, well, it's not it's okay if you are or not. No, you must be born again. So these are terms that we hear. And, and I want to ask you, all terms aside, 
if you were to die and stand before a holy God, would you be forgiven? Some of you might be hesitating with answering that question. You might say, I am not sure. The good news is you, can't, you can be sure, and it's not presumptuous to think that you can be, because God has given you a promise through the cross of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Some of you watching are saying, well, I hope so, I think so, maybe. No, these things have I written unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. How can you know? I believe what God said. I'm going to heaven not because I'm good or I'm righteous or I'm a nice guy. I believe what God said. I believe he said, if I confess my sins and trust Jesus Christ as my savior, God will give me eternal life. I believe that. God doesn't lie. So what about you today? Again, the question, if you were to die and stand before God, are your sins forgiven? They can be today. Why don't you make a decision and realize, I have violated the law of a holy God. I have sinned. All of us have, let's be honest. Nobody's perfect, we know that. There is a penalty to sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And now that we know there's a penalty to sin, Jesus Christ paid that penalty, paid that wage. And what you need to do is accept it. The Bible calls eternal life a gift. Why don't you accept that gift today? Bow your head with me and pray a simple prayer. Just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins, was buried and rose again. I repent of my sin and accept him as my savior. In Jesus' name, amen. There's contact information below. And if you trusted Christ today, or if you enjoy this program, or you just wanna share a few words with us, let us know what is going on in your life or how this program has impacted you. It would be a blessing. We do read your letters. We listen to your comments. And uh, we pray for you, those that ask for prayer. So why don't you go ahead and do that? That would be an encouragement. And one final thought, the stations that are broadcasting these programs, they have been very, very good to us and we appreciate what they do. But one thing they need to know is they need to know that you're watching, that there is somebody out there listening. There's somebody out there watching. And the favor that I would ask, could you contact the station right now that you are watching this program on telling them, letting them know, we love Pacific Garden Mission. Keep Pacific Garden Mission on the air. Pacific Garden Mission has been a blessing. That is such an encouragement because when we think about why we do this, I remember a story years ago, there was a lady that was in a crack house using drugs. One of our television programs came on, she came down to the mission and she told me that. She said, I was doing drugs and I heard it. So keep us on the air, it's impacting people, and God bless you so much and thank you for watching.